Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand and give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this place right now. We love you, Lord. We, come on, lift your voices to him as you clap your hands. God, do we love you. We worship you. We praise you. We lift you up, God, and we glorify your name. Great is the name of the Lord who's worthy to be praised. I love you, Lord. I worship you, God. Let's get ready and worship the Lord in a song or two. Hallelujah. As we begin this service. Treasures are laid up somewhere. How many feel that way? Hallelujah. I was thinking as she was singing that song, we talked, and I'm sure many of our elders in this place uh, can validate this, that this world has changed a lot since they were children. But I couldn't help but think even more. I believe that this world has probably changed more in the last five to ten years than the last fifty. The things that we're dealing with, the things the church is dealing with, the things that you as your families are dealing with, individuals are dealing with. I believe it's as simple as this. They talk about the, excuse me, the, the eagles, sometimes they would never leave the nest if the mother eaglet would 
is if that mother eagle wouldn't begin to stir that nest up and make it uncomfortable to get them to a place that they would want to leave the nest. Sometimes God has to make it a little uncomfortable in the world that we're living in. If not, we would want to stay here forever. But the Bible says that in the last days that the Lord will basically, or excuse me, the people of God will basically be say, we begin to pray, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that the spirit of the church should be and is. Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. Sing another song. Hallelujah. Walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you are trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got thankful for every guest that's in the house today. Let's make them welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want, I'll talk more about it in the second service, but I want Brother Copeland to come. It is an odd, I, I, I did tell him just earlier today, we were talking, and I said, Brother Copeland, I said, um, I really believe he rescheduled with me. I turned around, rescheduled with him, then we had to move it out again because he had somewhere he had to be for a couple weeks. I believe that God was the one doing the rescheduling because I believe he's here for the right moment at the right time. <laughs> Hallelujah. For you that are new, uh, this is Brother Frederick's pastor. And I told you Wednesday night, you're fit to get Brother Frederick on steroids this weekend. And uh, um, but it's going to remind you, or rather, Brother Frederick will remind you a lot of Brother Copeland. And I say that in a complimentary manner and, uh, and everything. But I, I want Brother Copeland to come. We'll talk a little bit more in preliminary next service. But I want him to obey the Holy Ghost. No strings attached. I told him already, I want you to work on me. Hallelujah. How many wants the Word of God to work on you today? Hallelujah, Brother Copeland. God bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> what a privilege and honor it is to be in the house of the Lord today. And uh, 
Anything can happen in a service like this. God is not limited. Anything can take place in the next few minutes. And I pray that it does. I pray that you're not expecting an average, ordinary, go through the motions and uh, get out of here in time to do whatever it is that you're planning on doing. Sunday is the Lord's day. It's the day that we do everything we can uh, to make him the center of what we're doing. I hope that whatever you've got to do this evening is not more important to you than what's going to happen in the next few minutes in this service. Hallelujah. I know that we have a second service and we're looking toward that, but never minimize this service because of what you're planning in the second service. Uh, I have a few things that I want to say right quick, and the first one is is that I give high honor uh, to your pastor, uh, Brother Mills. I give honor to this pastoral team that leads this church, Brother Sagely, God bless you, and then uh, the man that, that uh, caused all this, uh, De- uh, Daddy Mills, Bishop Mills, how, however y'all refer to him around here, he you wouldn't have a pastor if it wasn't for he and his great wife. They, uh, that's right. Several years ago at the uh, Copeland Christmas, uh, my grandfather and uh, grandmother, who were then in their 80s, um, were. it was one of the last Christmases that my grandfather was alive, We were all at their house. There were about 50 or 60 of us, and several of uh, them are Pentecostal preachers and pastors. And uh, We were all gathered in in their house, and uh, Brother Tim Copeland uh, prayed for the Christmas dinner and and then looked at my grandfather and said, have you got anything to say? And uh, he looked at my grandmother and looked at all the 50 or 60 of us Copeland standing around. He said, Elizabeth, can you believe we caused all this? <laughs> so thank you, Brother Mills, for giving this church a great pastor. It was uh, you and your wife raising this young man, putting the truth in his heart, and that's why we're all here today. And with that said, I want to talk to you for a few minutes. I want to give honor to this church for getting behind the leadership of this pastor and his wife. I want to talk to you for a few minutes, and I I want to tell you that praying on the way over here, and there's only one other place that I've talked about this lately, and this is the second place, and I'm not just bringing you words today. On the way here, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And said that God wants to make this a revival center. That we're from out of this place. Reaching effects of this area. I really believe that in the next few years. I don't know how long we've got left. It, it, it seems to me that Jesus is coming very quickly. But from now until the return of Jesus Christ, he would like to make this a hub of revival. That from this place, Daughter Works and other churches are affected for the cause of revival. But in order for that to happen, a lot of things have got to transpire very quickly in the heart and mind of this church. We're going to talk about this more in the second service, but I believe that God has sent me here not because I'm great. In order for a preacher to feel like he's great, you would have to feel like, act, act like this microphone is great. Because we are nothing more than spokesmen or amplifiers of what God wants to say. The only thing we can really do is position ourselves to where we're doing more than talking and just offering opinions, but we become the amplification of what God is saying to the church. So when I tell you that I'm bringing you words from God, it's not to lift me up or act like I'm anything. 
The only thing I can do is humble myself and say what God's saying. But I've come to bring you a message this weekend and tell you that a lot's got to happen real fast if you are going to be what God's calling you to be in the last days, the last moments. And when I say days, I believe time has been shortened. I believe Jesus is coming quickly, and you've got to quickly get the revelation of who you are, what you are, and what God has planned for you in the next little while. Great things are about to happen. I believe God has selected this church. I believe he's handpicked this church to do some great things, to be a hub of revival in this part of Louisiana in the, just the next few days so that great things can happen. What does that mean? That means a lot of money has got to be thrown at the kingdom of God. Boy, y'all were real excited till I said that. Woo, don't let talking about money put things on ice. Because not, God never asked for it. That he doesn't give it back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will never ask you to give into his kingdom that he does not give it back fourfold or tenfold. Never. God's never going to owe you. God's never going to. God's never going to put you in a position. That you regret giving because you gave and now you're in a bind. If you give and then you're in a bind, it's because you did something wrong. You gave out of the wrong spirit or for the wrong reason or in the wrong location. Hallelujah. Now you can buy a lottery ticket and get in a financial mess. You can go buy a four-wheeler and get in a financial mess. You can go buy a house you can't afford and get in a financial mess. You can go buy a car you can't afford and get in a financial mess. You can go spend $300 feeding your family at a restaurant and get yourself in a financial mess for a little while. But you will never get yourself in a financial mess giving to God's kingdom. Never. Because when you give to God's church, it's the only place that God promises. Here's what he says. Try me. Test me. Just give and see if I won't give it back, press down, shaken together, running over. He says he'll cause people just to walk up and give to you. That's what the Bible says. I have a, I have a, a, a man in my church, and I don't. I don't have time to get into this in this session because this is not what I want to talk about. We're going to talk about this Monday night. But just as way of introduc introductory, I have a man in my church that just this week got teared up and got to crying because uh, he, he a few years ago came to me weeping and said, Brother Copeland, I want to learn how to listen to that nudge. He says, I want God to nudge me. And I just immediately respond and give. He said, I want to be able to listen to that. When God nudges me or, or gives an amount, I would just want to give it because we have a tendency when God nudges us to start, to start compromising with him and trying to whittle him down, you know. It's like I, a, a person told me one day, he said, God told me to give this amount. He said, but I've talked back and forth to him two or three times and I've got him whittled down to $50. <laughs> He said, I don't want to do God that way. He said, I've been guilty of doing that in the past. He said, but I want, when God tells me to give, I just want to do it. And he, he got shook up because he came to me here a while back and he said, God's told me. He said, I started giving and God's blessed me. He said, when I first started giving, giving $1,000 was a big deal. And then God, I gave that $1,000 and God blessed. And a little while later, he asked me for 10000 and he said, I was a little nervous to give that, but you know what? But when I did that, it's just like God threw open the windows of heaven to my business and started blessing everything I touched. And he said, then God gave, told me to give 50000 
And he said, that really gave, made me nervous. He said, but this time, he said, God's told me to give $100,000. He said, but you know what started happening? He said, people started walking up to me and wanting to sell me their property at a, at a very cheap rate. And he said, he said, that had never happened to me before. He said, but... I've had people walk up to me and say, I want to sell you my, my property. I've got 100 acres of land I'd like to sell to you. I'm not even going to go to a realtor. And, and he said, man, it just, God just started blessing me with stuff. He said, people walk up and tell me they want to sell me their house. And he said, it, 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 I wouldn't have been able to even have the opportunity to buy it. But they, they picked me out. And he said, it's just amazing what he's just came to me it's just it's just been offered to me and I said that that's because the Bible says that if you'll give God will cause people to give into your bosom that's the way the Bible says it that men will just men will just give it to you and he said it, it's I've had opportunities to buy things at tremendous deals that would have never came to me it would have been offered to a family member or someone else but people just show up at my house wanting to sell me stuff and he said, because of that, I've been able to buy things and prove it and sell it and, and make. He said, it was just here a while back that a, a man said, I'm closing my business down and I, I want you to have my business. And he said, this business that I purchased has already paid for itself in just a, just, just a little while. And he said, this business is added Twenty or thirty thousand dollars a month to my business that's just free money. I mean, they just walked up and handed me this opportunity. Said, I want you to have it. He said, and it's all because I learned to listen to the nudge. Now, why would God pick a man out and just start blessing him like that? The main reason, listen to me, this is very important. This is why I'm coming to you today in this session. The reason why is because in today's economy, it takes money to have revival. We're a long ways from setting up a tent and having a guy string, strumming a guitar that's missing two strings under a coal oil lantern, swallowing bugs in, in sawdust. You set up a tent like that today in today's economy and very few people are going to drive up and sit under that tent in 110 degrees sweating in South Louisiana. Things have changed in 100 years. Today, you have to, you have, to have a nice building. You have to run hundreds of dollars a night in air conditioning. Or a week, I'm sorry, in air conditioning. You, you've got to supply... Uh, lights and you've got to be online and you've got to be uh, letting people know what's going on on Facebook and th th that things have changed it listen to me it cost a lot of money to have revival in 2021 and so if God picks out a place reason with me just a little bit that's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 1 and 18 he said hey let's get together and talk about this let's reason this out Though your sins be as scarlet, thou shalt be white as snow. But I want to reason with you about something else today. If God has cho if I'm right, God's chosen this church to be a center of revival in this part of Louisiana. If he's brought a man here, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the, in the next few minutes, but let me finish up this portion. If he's brought a man here, anointed that man and said, look, we got to have revival in this area. People have got to be filled with the Holy Ghost in this area. I'm sending you to lead my people in this area. Then that means, if, if that, that man comes here, then somebody's got to fund that man's vision. If he's going to do it, he's got to have the funds to operate. Now, people think that money is a dirty word. But it's not. A third of the New Testament is about stewardship. One third of your New Testament, God talks about 
I'm going to give you money and you've got to handle that money properly. Look at the first two or three verses of the 8th chapter of the book of Luke. And you will find out that God picked out some real wealthy women. Some of them was in Herod's court. That's the way God always does it. He, he, in the Old Testament, he anointed people in Pharaoh's house to raise his prophet, to fund his prophet that was going to lead the people out. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house, funded and taught in Pharaoh's house to be put in position to lead the, lead the people out. In Luke, the 8th the, the eighth chapter, the first few verses, in fact, since, since we're here, would one of y'all find it and read it? Luke, Luke chapter 8 and uh, verse 2. Luke 8 and 2. Thank you, Brother Sagely. Have I got, have I got 15 or 20 more minutes? Am, am, am I right? Because I want to I wanna be, be in the right time to do this properly. I think you said uh, uh, 220. Is that correct? Man, I got plenty of time. I'm in good shape. God anointed some ladies, gave them funds, and here's what the Bible says. The Bible said that any city that Jesus was going to go teach in, that these ladies would go ahead of Jesus and rent halls. You see, the Last Supper was in a rented room. Somebody paid for that room. Somebody paid for the food they ate. Somebody baked the bread. I mean, do y'all think all that stuff just appeared? Who bought the bread Jesus took and put in sup and handed to, to Judas in an effort to keep him from doing the wrong thing? Who paid for that table they were sitting at? Who paid for the, the, the candles that were burning to offer the light? You see, it wasn't like today. There was, there was, if you took Jesus and the 12 disciples, that's 13 people. How many of y'all like to feed 13 people this evening on the spur of the moment? Anybody like to have 13 people show up at your house to eat this evening? So much the more in that day, somebody had to gather wood. I mean, you don't just, even in that day, you just didn't just show up in somebody's yard and cut one of their trees down. Somebody had to, had to kill an animal. Somebody had to, had to clean that animal. Somebody had to put food on a fire. Somebody had to, had to roll out, the, 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 grind the corn or the wheat. Roll out bread. Bake that bread. There had to be a room for 13 people at least together in. Exactly. Somebody had to put a tablecloth on the table. and Somebody had to put dishes out and cups and saucers. So, so having money and places and lights and food to have revival is not a new idea. It's 2,000 years old. Read Luke, the 8th chapter, and I believe it's the 2nd verse is where I'm looking for, I think. The 2nd and 3rd verse. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities married There were some women that had prayed through in Jesus' revival efforts. Read on. Mary called Magdalene, uh -huh. out, of whom, out of whom went seven devils. Yes. And Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod's steward, and Susanna. And so Lisa. Herod, who tried to destroy Jesus... Hello? who wanted him killed, who was against this movement, his steward's wife used money that was coming out of Herod's court to make sure Jesus had the means and the money to preach the gospel. Read on. And many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Y'all know what substance is? It's a fancy way of saying their money. Read on. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, mm -hmm. he spake a parable. Yeah. So here's people that took their finances that they were getting from the enemy 
And they went, the Bible says, if you'll read this, it says they went ahead of him into the cities and prepared so that when he got there, he would have a place to teach, a place to sleep, a place to eat, food to eat, and in order to feed his disciples. So when the Bible says that Jesus didn't have any money and didn't have a place to lay his head, it wasn't saying that he went without eating and went with a place without sleeping. It meant that someone else funded that vision. Mm. Now, God hadn't just sent you anybody to, to Jackson, Louisiana, to the apostolic church of the I love the vision that I see in the very name of this church we're not limiting this to this area we're going to reach the whole area we're going to reach this metro area with the gospel we're not just come to one city or one location we're going to reach this whole area I love that vision but somebody has to fund that vision now had you rather the vision be funded by someone outside the church? Should you rather someone show up and, and say, you know what, what I, man, I got a multi-billion dollar corporation. I need a tax right off here. I think I'm going to give your church two or three million dollars. Would you like for it to happen that way? Or had you rather God pick out ten people in this church and so bless them Mm. that we're the ones that fund the vision therefore we're the ones that get blessed you see years ago years ago I was sitting under a pastor brother Treadway and he said look we're, we're going to build a building and it's going to be paid off now there's one or two ways we can do this God can pick some of y'all out that he can trust to bless and y'all can do y'all can build this building and pay for it, or I can just be riding down the road and find a bunch of money and an old boot on the side of the road. Which way would y'all rather do it? Because God has promised that He's going to bless wherever it comes from. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather Him bless His church. I'd rather Him bless Israel than have to bless Egyptians. When I got to preaching this in Sebastopol, Mississippi, I had some men stand up and said, I, I, I'd like to be the funnel. I'd like to be one of the funnels that funnel the funds into this church. I, I would like to tell God, God, you can trust these hands not to get greedy. You can flow money through me to fund my pastor's vision, and I won't get greedy with you, God. I, I'll let it flow through. I'll... Because I'm going to tell you the beautiful thing is, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, if, I'm sure many of you men have put oil in a car before. And I'm sure many of you women have used a funnel in the kitchen to put olive oil or whatever other kind of oil into a cake or into a recipe. And you know, the, the, the thing that was kind of aggravating until I turned this thing around and I became the funnel. The thing that was aggravating, what aggravated me as a boy, because all was expensive, you know. And I, I, that's what I had to drive when I was young. Things have come a long ways. But back in the 80s when I was a teenager, cars burned a lot of oil. Or at least the ones I could afford to drive did. Any of y'all have any of those memories? Any of y'all old enough to have those memories? And when I filled my car up with gas, I had to put a quart of oil in it too. <laughs> Two quarts of oil, he said. And the, the state could have hired me to help fog mosquitoes. And, and you, you know, the, the thing is, is what aggravated me is I'd throw that, I'd throw that, that funnel in the trunk of my car. And it seemed like half a quart of that oil ended up in the, in the bottom of my car. Because it was, when you pour stuff through a funnel, part of it sticks to the funnel. Mm. Y'all going to get it in just a second. 
God's not going to flow, flow finances through you without a whole lot of it sticking to the funnel. That's a wonderful thing is it as it flows through you, it's going to stick to you. But here's the whole thing. God, it all comes down to T-U-R-S-T. It is a chain of trust. God has to be able to trust you not to get greedy while you're supplying yourself as a funnel to fund the vision. But God always first sends you a man you can trust. You see, you got to be able to trust the man. And God's got to be able to trust you. And God never sends you a man and offers the vision without trusting the man. So it becomes a big complete cycle of trust. God trusts a man. He sends him to a place and gives him a vision. And then he trusts you. And you give because you trust the man that God sent with the vision. And it becomes a cycle of trust. And so that brings me to my ending here that I got just a few minutes to end. Listen to me. This is very important. God sent you a genuine number one giant killer to this area. Yes, he did. He sent you a man that in the Spirit, through prayer and operating in the Holy Ghost, has the ability to kill every spiritual giant that would stop the revival of this church. Now, there's a lot of you that look at this man and say, well, he's a small man in stature. That doesn't matter. Because he stands 10 feet tall in the spirit. I don't have to say any of this. He didn't ask me. He didn't bring me here to say any of this. But I'm telling you, you can trust the man that God has sent you. You can trust him. If God opened up the windows of heaven and blessed one of you people, one of you wonderful people, with $10 million, you wouldn't have to worry about writing a $10 million tithing, I mean a million dollar tithing check. And then turn around and say, you know what? I think God's blessed me. I think I'm just going to match it. I'm going to write a million dollar tithing check. And I'm going to write a million dollar offering check. Pastor, go build the church that God gave you the vision to build. You see, there's a lot of people that don't think a thing about God trusting them with a million dollars. But they're scared that they can't trust their pastor with a million. There was a there, there was a man that that went to his pastor, and and I, I'm all, I'm talking about fun, trusting the pastor to fun, to fund the vision that God's given him. That's the subject that I want to talk to you about. That I've talked to you about today is trust. There was a man that went to his pastor and said, Pastor, and of course this was years ago. He said, Pastor, I, I wish God would, would give me a job. Man, I'd like, to, I'd like to pay big tithes. And so the pastor laid hands on him and said, God, this man wants to fund the vision of this church. Open up the windows of heaven on this man. The next thing you know, and of course this was back in the 70s, this man went from paying $10 a week in tithing to paying $100 a week in tithing. He came up, he was so excited, he said, man, my tithe check this week is $100. God's blessed me. His boss came to him and, and, and doubled his salary because the pastor had been praying, unheard of in that day. He was paying $200 a week in tithing. And the next thing you know, his, his 
tithing just stopped. The pastor got to praying about it. Man, this guy had bought a new house, bought a new car. He went and bought his wife a new car. He was buying guns, investing in hunting clubs, and, and his tithing just, just dried up. And the pastor called him in after several weeks of this. He called him in and said, Brother, what on earth is going on? And the man said, well, honestly, Pastor, I just got worried about you. He said, you did. He said, yeah, I got, I got worried that something bad would happen to you. I mean, there's several people that go to this church. It's obvious that you've already got a pretty good income. And on top of that, if I, if I, if I added just $200 a week for you just to just a blow here and there. I mean, it's hard for me to trust you with that kind of money. I wouldn't want something to go to your head. And the pastor said, well, what about you? What about all this money you're handling? You, you're not worried about yourself? <laughs> well, you know, I've been trained and taught to handle that kind of money. I don't know if you've had that kind of training. He said, well, you know what? We can fix this whole problem right now. He laid hands on that man. He said, God, this man's got a heavy load to bear, worried about me and all this tithe and he has to pay to me. And I sure don't want you to curse him because he's not paying his tithes. Why don't you knock him back down to that $10 a week where we don't have to worry about this and don't have a... Boy, he jerked his hand off his... Don't pray that, Pastor. He said, well, then you need to do the right thing. This is all based on trust. If God can trust you, then you can trust me. Uh, oh, come on, somebody. I'm almost done, but God hadn't just sent you anybody in this man. He, he has sent a man that can have the vision. I've talked for hours with this man about his vision, not just for this church, but where this church is going and the revival in this area. You know what this man never talks to me about? He never talks to me about a vacation house he wants to buy. He never talks to me about new cars he wants to purchase. He never talks to me about some big house he's looking at. When I talk to this man, you know what he always says? I got to get that church built. I, I, I got I to gotta get that new. We got to have more room to accommodate the growth that God's got to send. This building can't handle the revival that God wants to send this church in this area. There is a revival that can't happen in the limited space. Somehow we got to get a church built. We, we got to expand the auditorium. God's wanting to send gr people's grandkids. God's wanting to send people's brothers and sisters. God's wanting to fill people's neighbors. That's what for the last several years has consumed this man's vision. This church can trust this man. Somebody asked you, what they teach about today at the church house? You tell them the subject was trust. I can trust my pastor. I can trust him with millions to build a new building so that we can have revival because that's what it's going to take. And God wants to trust me. He wants to bless me on my job. He wants to bless me in my business. He wants to make me a funnel because God sent us a Moses that we can trust to lead us out of this wilderness into revival and on into Canaan's land in just a few days. But there's a work that's got to be done in that next few days. Somehow we've got to get the attention of our neighbors and our family members focused on the church. And I'm going to tell you, nothing does like that like the church going forward. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, Brother Copeland, what's brought the greatest revival to your church? We had several more get the Holy Ghost today. We're at 100 and somewhere between 110 and 120. I don't have an exact number that's got the Holy Ghost in the last few months for Brother Frederick. We're having five and 600 in every service. My, my wife texted me today and said, babe, we got to get that balcony opened up. Our building's packed. Our building's packed out. We got a huge group today. We got visitors. I don't even know who they are or where they came from. 
you've got to understand that's in a, in a town of 300 people. You, you've got to realize that we've not got the metro area to deal with that y'all have to deal with. The biggest town around us is three, uh, between three and 5,000 people. The largest town. That's 15 to 20 miles away. We're in cow pastures, but God's sending them from everywhere. What happened? Listen to me. This is very important. Closing moments. The people learned they could trust me. They learned that they could trust me with their finances. They learned that they could trust me with their offerings, their giving. And they began to open up in giving. When they did, God started blessing them and blessing their businesses. And now there's many, many multi-million dollar businesses in that church. As the people got blessed, what do you think their neighbors did? Their neighbors started taking notice. What's going on with you? How, how, how is all this happening? I'm not seeing you change. You still look like you're apostolic. You still look like you go to that church, but you, 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 you're blessed. And, here, and, and that's God's whole plan. In Genesis, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, he says, through you, I want to bless all nations of the earth. What does that mean? It means that they, he, God wants the people to look at you and say, how are you, what's happened to you? And for you to say, it's the God that I serve. And for them to get thirsty. That's why he said, I'm making you the salt of the earth. He wants your neighbors to get thirsty for your God as they see the blessing that's on you and your family. My God, have mercy. But it all starts with you jumping on the vision of this man and saying, I can trust this man. And God did send him to lead us out. And first of all, into a place of blessing, and then on into Canaan's land. But we've got to get this thing opened up so that we can take my kids and my grandbabies and my neighbors and my brothers and sisters with us. Something's got to happen. A great revival's got to break out before Jesus comes so that we don't go into the glory world empty-handed. Would you stand together and lift your hands right now? Would you ask God, God, show me, open my mind, open my understanding. I know I trust this pastor, God. I do, but I want you to, I want you to put an unreserved trust for this leader in my heart. And then, God, I want you to trust my hands. I want you to trust my spirit. We're going somewhere in the Holy Ghost. God sent me to tell you. He wants to make you the revival center for this area. It's got to go out from here. This has got to be the revival hub. And then from here, he's going to send the light. Hey, hey are you listening to me? He's going to send the light. Have you heard the Macedonian call today? Oh, there's areas all around this church that says send the light, send the gospel, send the mission. But he's got to, he's got to anoint some funnels. Lift your hands and say, God, make me one of those men. Trust me, God, as I trust your man. Trust my hands. Trust my home. Trust my family. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, would you reach out? I've cast a little bit of vision today. Can you grab a hold of it? You know what? The devil, the devil would not like to make you critical of what I've preached today. The devil would like to put, put some criticism in your spirit. And there may be those, but let me tell you this. Just like in the Old Testament, you'll never see the vision. You'll be trampled in the doorway. But those of you that can catch the vision, you'll enter in. You'll go into this. Lift your hands and cry out one last time as I turn this thing to your pastor. God bless you today in Jesus' name. Oh, lift your hands and receive it right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just feel something blowed into this house. He was so well preaching. 
feel like the Lord begin to show me that every person in this building is already a funnel. Some are larger than others. Some have their end of the funnel, their spout stopped up, plugged up. Before God can increase that funnel, you've got to unstop the current funnel you got. If he can't trust you with what you've already got, don't expect to trust him to trust you with more. I'm trying to stay very positive, but there's individuals sitting under the sound of my voice right now. You have sat in my office, or I've had you in my office about you being consistent in paying your tithe. I'm done talking to you about it. I'm going to let God deal with it. There's an individual sitting here today that I plan to talk to today. But God said, I'll take care of it. Hallelujah. You say, you said, brother, you just said, I don't, I don't, I don't need him. I don't need, I'm not, uh, let me, let me rephrase that, God. I don't need it to pay my bills any, any more than what I got right now. I want to see you blessed so that the church can be blessed and I can put more back into the church. That, hallelujah. There is hardly a time that I pray that I don't lay hands in that foyer on them tithing envelopes and in them offering. And I have asked God to turn it way over a million dollars. You said, Brother Mel, do you want to be a millionaire? I told him I'll live off of 10% of it and give 90% of it back to the church. Whatever comes in, if he'll do it. I have prayed that for a few years now, and where I caught that vision, that was this man right here. Because I watched what happened at Sebastopol. I had Brother Copeland call me on the way, and he said, is there anything that you're feeling? He said, I know you want me to talk about being blessed and different things tomorrow night, but is there anything you're feeling? I said, Brother Copeland, no, I, there's nothing. I just want you to obey God. I just want you to obey God. That's all I want. I, I, nothing. I didn't talk to him about any of y'all. Nothing like that. I said, I just want you to obey God. And I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost. There, there's literally two to three people in this place, at least, that God showed me you and transformed you into a funnel. And I, when I looked at you on the seat, all I seen was a funnel. But God said that he can do the pouring, but you got to let it flow. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just lift your hands one more time. He I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. My God, my God, my God. Go ahead, go ahead. Come on. You I'm going to say this, and if it's a dismiss you, as an evangelist, I would, there's an old saying when I worked in the corporate world is, if Chad Mills can't fix the problem, he'll just create a spreadsheet. And um, I had a spreadsheet when I evangelized. I still got it. And I would put places on their churches, tier one, tier two, and tier three. And what that meant was tier one, I would drop whatever I was doing as long as the Lord would allow, and I was going there for revival. Brother Copeland's was one of them. There's only about five or six of those. Tier two was, I would go, I wanted to go there for revival again, but I wasn't going to break my neck to get there. I just work them in as, or as the Lord said it. 
tier three was, God was going to, I was, I was going to do everything but become Jonah. I didn't want to go back. And there was a few of those too. But there was things in those spreadsheets that I would have, and Brother Sebastian Ford probably got on that spreadsheet a long list of pros of what I like about this church that I want to pull. We call them, Elder Mills, we're talking about best practices that, that you want to learn and you want to, different things. But I remember of saying I felt like there were five things in a church as an evangelist. Of course, evangelists always know everything. And, and our five things whenever I pastor that I feel like needs to be in a church. And I remember telling it to my, my current pastor, Brother Ozel. I remember he, he was just the elder in my life at the time. And I said, there are five things I feel like prayer, fasting. Y'all have heard me say this before. Uh, you know, outreach, the word of God, worship. I said, if you get those five things, man, you're going to have a revival church. And Brother Ozel said, you're missing one ingredient. I said, what's that? He said, it takes, brother, money to have revival. He said, you need to have giving on there. And and, uh, and it, that is so true. You can have the biggest vision in the world. But it, but I, I tell you what, I want to be. I want to be that funnel. He said, I want to be that funnel. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you so much for the... Uh, Awesome job, Brother Copeland. Awesome job. I'm looking forward to this second service. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.